dude. They'll come through the door. I will shoot. Hi, I'm Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV, the podcast, the videos, the whole thing. I'm very, very grateful. Make sure you do check us out on these other platforms because YouTube has a tendency to uh, to shadow ban and demonetize and sometimes just downright delete a video. So check us out on Rumble. Check us out on Twitter. Those are the two most mainstream locations. You will find the channel other places as well. And I do urge you to check out the Gun Guy TV Firearms Podcast. It's available on your favorite podcast player, as well as Twitter, Rumble, and believe it or not, on YouTube, unless they delete it. <laughs> there you go. All right. I have an interview today with Chuck Michelle from the California Rifle and Pistol Association and Michelle and Associates and the Second Amendment Law Center. He's in a lot of different places there. And we're going to talk about the California assault weapons ban that St. Judge Benitez just declared unconstitutional the other day. We'll get an update as to exactly what's going on with that. What did Judge Benitez do in the decision, which I've read and I know Chuck has as well, and where Chuck thinks this is going and how it benefits us. So without going any further into it, let's go talk to Chuck. So in any case, I mean, I, if you haven't read the decision, I mean, essentially Benitez eviscerated the whole feature-based well, I mean, he, he not only did he take on the feature-based quite assault weapon, you know, ban as far as rifles are concerned. He also took on the the threaded barrel issue with handguns and pointed out how nonsensical that was. I thought that was interesting. He went after that as well. So it's a really, really good decision. And then he did give him ten days to appeal. What What are your thoughts on that? Because I don't know how this works. Whether we can, are we expecting this to be grabbed on bonk again, like the Oh, like the, well, okay, so let, 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 let's talk uh, about the yeah. process here. Okay, first that'll first help. All, everybody, everybody, should, I have read the opinion. Everybody should read the opinion, just like they should read the Duncan opinion uh, from a couple weeks ago that we that we that, that we won in front of Judge Benitez. A lot of uh, he, he used he kind of copy and pasted some of the analysis because it's the same analysis, uh, just a different arm. Um, uh, but everybody should read it because it's a civics lesson and it's a lesson in how Bruin, the Bruin rationale, the Bruin methodology from the Supreme Court is supposed to be applied. Uh, and that's a very simple, simple thing. Does the conduct being regulated, is it covered by the right to keep, i.e. possess or bear, i.e. carry an arm? And almost every arm, including frankly, dangerous and unusual arms. They will be covered by the text of the Second Amendment. Almost every bearable arm is going to be covered. It's not supposed to be a big test. It's just a question. And then once you answer that question, the state has the burden of proving that there is something about the particular arm that's being regulated that, that, that uh, allows the state to regulate it. And that has to be some historical analog, some historical law that indicates that the founders would tolerate the modern day law. And what the Supreme Court has said is, in the case of dangerous or unusual, excuse me, excuse me, big mistake, state tries to do that, dangerous and unusual firearms or arms, historically, there are historical laws that regulated dangerous and unusual arms, which is mostly like exotic arms like a, a, a cane gun or a wallet gun or something like that. Uh, but never has there been a ban on commonly possessed for lawful purposes, not just self-defense, any lawful purpose, uh, hunting, sport shooting, marksmanship, uh, whatever. Uh, if, if, if So unless there's a dangerous or unusual uh, unless the arm being regulated current mo in modern day is dangerous and unusual, then there's no historical analog for a complete ban on the possession. And the interesting thing was he gave the state every opportunity to put in, pile on the record. Uh, they put something like 300 laws from, you know, 200 years before the, 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 the Bill of Rights was ratified to 
like 1960 and tried to argue that this was all indicate in, indicative that the founding fathers would have tolerated this possession ban, but none of those laws banned the possession of a class of firearms at all, not to mention firearms that were commonly owned for lawful purposes. So that's the stage that he sets. That, you, that, that There is no historical analog. All these arms are covered by the text of the Second Amendment. They're bearable arms. And th there's no historical analog. The state can't meet its burden to prove that, that this law would have been tolerated by the founders. And so then he goes through law by law, basically, in groups, and says, here's why this isn't apply. Here's why this doesn't apply. Then he goes through expert by expert and says, here's why this testimony was useless. Here's why this testimony was biased. Here's why this testimony doesn't prove a thing. And so he dissected, you might say eviscerated, the state's case line by line, uh, point by point, and finally came to the logical conclusion that the assault, the so-called assault weapon, the Assault Weapon Control Act is the name of the law, was unconstitutional, just as he had uh, several years ago, uh, before Bruin even came down. So remember what happened here. The, the, the several challenges to semi-auto bans were filed by CRPA, by Second Amendment Foundation, by FPC, by other groups. Uh, uh, CRPA's case were up, uh, went up to the Ninth Circuit. Miller went up to the Ninth Circuit. Duncan went up to the Ninth Circuit. All those cases were in the Ninth Circuit pending. Uh, Duncan was the furthest along. Duncan went on bonk. Dunk, uh, Duncan won on the three-judge panel, went on bonk, lost 7-4 on the on bonk panel, went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court held on to it until after Bruin came down, then remanded it. And while it was up in the Supreme Court, all these other cases were stayed. They were frozen to wait to see what came out of Bruin. When Duncan came back down, it was remanded. So was Miller. So was Rody. So were all the other cases that had been in this bottleneck in the Ninth Circuit. And we, you and I talked about this when it was happening. Uh, and so they all, the Ninth Circuit then remanded them back down to Judge Benitez where they started. So we went up and back down, started all over again. It was a do-over. But now it was a do-over where the court, the Ninth Circuit said, Judge Benitez, apply Bruin now instead of Heller only and tell us if these laws are still unconstitutional. And, of course, he said, in the case of Duncan, yes, the magazine ban is still unconstitutional. And he said, in case of the, uh, the assault weapon challenge, uh, yes, these laws are still unconstitutional. So it's a fantastic ruling, very well thought out, very well documented. He has... 260 footnotes in a 71 page, or I think it's a 71 page opinion. So uh, he knew it was going to be appealed. He wanted to make the record, and he did. And he, and he just, his analysis is spot on, spot on. But the big, the big, I know we're going to get to what's going to happen next with the stay. But the big thing uh, that we talked about last time I was on is the methodology. So now you've got, Duncan, you've got Tedder, the, the uh, Hawaii butterfly knives. You've got Wol Wolford, the Hawaii sensitive places. You've got Miller now, the semi-auto ban. And there's a couple others that I can't even remember at the moment in the Ninth Circuit. Duncan is the furthest along. Duncan is back in front of the en banc panel. All of these cases, the states are going nuts because they know that if the methodology of Bruin is applied the way that it was applied by Judge Benitez in Duncan and Miller, and by some other judges in other parts of the country, it's not just the Ninth Circuit, this, this litigation is going on nationwide, then a lot of gun laws are going to be struck down as unconstitutional. So that's why the state is so desperately trying to convolute the Bruin test to, to say that that first question about whether or not your conduct is covered by the text, you know, keeper and, or, and bear, uh, they're trying to say that only applies to guns that are in common use. They're, in other words, they're taking the common use test, which isn't really a test, is a historical analog test. And if they're not dangerous, unusual, and they are in common use, then there's no historical analog. They're trying to put that in the first part and make the textual question 
a test that you have to overcome that the, the, that the plaintiffs, the, the people challenging the law, have to overcome before they can succeed. That's not how it works. But that's what some judges have bought into, and that's what the states are praying that they'll be able to get the Ninth Circuit to do. So what's going to happen in Miller next? Uh, the state has already appealed. Uh, Judge Benitez knew they would. They asked for him to stay his ruling while they appealed, which he did, just like he did in Duncan. We gave them 10 days to appeal and seek a stay from the Ninth Circuit. They filed within hours, so obviously they predicted this would come. And they had their paperwork already done. Uh, they filed their notice of appeal in the Ninth Circuit. Now they'll be asking the Ninth Circuit to stay Judge Benitez's ruling, which they will. I mean, they're going to. Uh, I'm sure that the plaintiffs in that case will contest that, and they should, and, and they're right. They, they shouldn't stay, and it's so obviously unconstitutional. But the Ninth Circuit will maintain the status quo. The motion there, There's a motions panel in front of the Ninth Circuit, then there's the merits panel. But, so Miller was never in front of an en banc panel. panel. Neither was Tedder, neither was Wolford, only Duncan. So all those cases go back in front of a three-judge panel. Tedder actually already had a three-judge panel and won, so that will now go to the on the, the Hawaii is already asking the en banc panel to take the, the, the butterfly knife case, the Tedder case. Uh, so the brawl, and it is a brawl, amongst the justices in the Ninth Circuit is over what is the appropriate methodology in evaluating, how do you apply Bruin? What does Bruin require courts to do to test the constitutionality of a gun control law? And we should win that. But that is the heart, that is the crux of the, of the legal debate going on right now. It's not about magazines. It's not about semi-autos. It's not about butterfly knives. There's a Billy, Billy, Club, Billy Club case that will be coming out of Judge Benitez's court pretty soon. There's the ammunition background check case, the roadie case, which will be coming out of there in a month or so, probably. It's not about the in other underlying issue, per se. It's about the methodology that you that all courts have to apply, no matter what law is being challenged, when deciding whether or not a gun control law is constitutional. Okay, so I'm going to ask a, probably a layperson's stupid question, because I understand that in the world of legal beagles, that that statement makes a lot of sense. But in the world of gun owners, it makes no dang, no sense at all. And the reason why it doesn't make any sense is because gun owners sit around watching these cases go all the way up, come all the way down, go all the way up, come all the way down, go all the way up, come all the way down. We get a decision like this when we get a decision like Duncan. We all jump up and down and say, gee, what a great decision. How wonderful is that? We're all celebrating about it. And then nothing changes. Years pass. I'm on this show. You're on this show. Rick is on this show. Sam is on this show. Eric Pratt, whomever, come on this show. And what do we say to gun owners constantly? Be patient. Hang in there. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And here's the problem, Chuck. And this is where I'm going to put you on the spot. It never does. Well, and that's did. the attitude of gun owners is we, it, it never ends. We never win. We always end up in front of some court, whether it's the ninth or whatever, that either plays games, cheats or whatever. And we're and we, it just never changes. We have a momentary thing where we can have a beer and celebrate the decision. But it, but from a practical perspective in the day to day life of gun owners, it's the same. And that's where we're going now, aren't we? Well, yes and no. Not to okay. be a, a help, lawyer. help me out because, like I like I said to you the other day, I'm looking for some hope for gun owners in these things. And I got to tell you, more and more, I talk to people who have just said, "Oh, screw it. What's the difference?" Well, okay. Consider when Heller came down. Okay. It took us 12 years to get the United States Supreme Court to tell all the courts that they were applying Heller wrong. That was the Bruin case. You have to get the underlying standard of review, the, 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 the methodology, the, the, the test. You have to get that squared away before you can win. And it has to, and, and Bruin gave us that test, but now we're going through the same baloney that we went through after Heller where the courts are distorting it. Once that issue is settled though, and the methodology is being argued in every case in the country, but once that issue is settled, things are going to go much, much faster. The debate right now, that's the point I'm trying to make. The debate isn't about magazines or semi-autos. The debate's about the methodology. And the Supreme Court might address it in Rahimi, 
as they have right now. But once they do, once they say, once the Supreme Court or the Ninth Circuit, because there's now 50 percent uh, uh, conservative thinking judges on the Ninth Circuit. It used to be one third. Now it's 50 percent. The Ninth Circuit could conceivably agree that the Bruin says what Judge Benitez uh, said it says. And then we didn't even have to go to the Supreme Court. Because we will have the methodology, and once that methodology is in place, all these other cases are going to be like dominoes. So just well, okay, I, and I, I, yeah, I get it. With this crap for two decades, I know. <laughs> I'm 65 I mean, years old, buddy. I've been at it for a long time. I get it. Okay, so but here's and and I'm and again, I'm not beating you up, Chuck, but at all. But I think this these questions are valuable to ask because I hear the frustration, as I know you guys at CRPA do, from gun owners all the time because it does yeah, never totally seem to end. So, it, but help me help me with one thing, and I, I I hear what you're saying, and I and I accept it. At what point is it settled? And the reason I asked that question is because we thought it was settled in Heller, and it wasn't. We thought it was settled with Bruin, and these lower courts keep playing games with it. At what point is it so settled that these lower courts cannot play these idiotic games? I mean, just the idea of these, I mean, how, if you look at it on a percentage basis, I did the other day, I thought it was interesting. I did a little bit of re what research I could do on the web. How often does a case go to the en banc panel in the Ninth Circuit? It doesn't happen very often, statistically. Oh, and, ha absolutely. and how often has it happened? I couldn't, now maybe you, you can tell me. I have not found a case. I looked, I couldn't find one. I searched around a whole bunch of different places. And I think Costas pointed something, one of your attorneys pointed something out on um, um, Twitter or something the other day about it, that I, I don't think there's ever been an example of a case in which the state won in a Second Amendment case that ever went on bonk. It only happens when they lose. Right. And so that, that's how twisted yeah. the Ninth Circuit is. Well, they're not the on bonk panel, the, the, that's the 25 judges right. voting to take a a, a, a case to the eleven judge panel on bonk panel, uh, and then the, because historically they were pretty uh, safe to to get a majority on the on bonk panel and then uh, shoot us down, but that's the, the step one. That's not guaranteed anymore. And step two, after Bruin, it's not going to be. There's going to be some liberal judges who are classical liberals as opposed to progressive liberals who are not thinking the same way as Gavin Newsom, they're going to say, my job is to follow what the Supreme Court says and be honest about it. And so we could switch some votes. But getting back to your main point, which is, yes, this takes forever. The only thing I can do to put this into context, go, go back to segregation and, and the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. I mean, watch Eye on the Prize. I didn't realize that after the Supreme Court ruled that schools could not be segregated it took 15 years or more i mean in some respects we're still fighting it uh to uh to to get all the politicians and in, 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 in that case it was democrats democrats who didn't want to integrate uh, uh to to play ball and 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 follow the supreme court precedent this is just as historic maybe not as important to a specific group of people uh, but maybe it is. I mean, gun owners are certainly have their 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 interest. Point is, uh, these this is a huge, huge history history making and future predicting issue that's being fought right now. And it, you know, all this all the social battles that are going on in this country right now over wokeness, cancel culture, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever the progressive ultra progressive agenda is. All that stuff, the Second Amendment and the rights to keep our arms is the tip of the spear. And Newsom and his cronies know that. And so they do not want, that's why he's looking at the 28th Amendment, you know, to, to, to basically repeal the Second Amendment effectively. Because he knows if you can't disarm the people, then you can't get away with tyranny. And he is a couple of elections away from becoming what a lot of people would call is tyrannical. The way he's jamming the government's roll down our throats and making the having the government make our decisions rather than rather than us make in, decisions for ourselves rather than us making decisions about how to lead our leave our own lead our own lives he wants to tell us how to live 
That's their progressive agenda. That's what we're fighting. It's more than just uh, uh, the right to keep and bear arms, but the right to keep and bear arms, as I said, is the tip of the spear. So I understand it's taken too long. Believe me, but it is going to speed up. There's a there's another fundamental issue we got to get resolved, and then all the uh, major issues, CCW, you know, and, and where you can where you can carry uh, and how you can carry and semi autos and uh, magazines and prohibited people and prohibited places and all these other major issues, those are going to settle out fast, relatively fast. I say fast. That ain't fast. It's not fast in the mind. <laughs> no, it's not fast. It's it. And, you know, no. and i got to tell you something. You know, Chuck, we're friends, and I love you a ton, and I'm grateful that you come on the show and let me beat you up a little bit because these are the kind of questions I get, and I don't have the oh, knowledge to answer them. And so it's good that you do. I appreciate that. Me too. I mean, I, look, what can I say? I mean, we're not – this is it's not time to start shooting okay <laughs> let's not go get carried away here you got to work through the system the system is well, and here, okay and here's the frust i mean some of the frustrating part is what we've already talked about but the other frustrating part is we work through the system and we follow the rules they don't well yes the system is rigged the they cheat. Is rigged, and 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 now recently there's been some stuff that makes it really more apparent that some of the judicial actions at least in the ninth circuit uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the judges themselves are in are saying that the system was rigged, and so that yeah that believe me that hurts me because you know law school they teach you to have faith in the judicial system and thirty years out of law school I pretty much don't have that much faith in the judicial system it's it's political uh, on on so many levels and there's so many judges who aren't they probably don't really deserve to be on the bench, you know. Probably. Uh, <laughs> now I'm not talking. <laughs> uh, Chuck Michelle, you're no, a comedian. No. Probably. I'll you know, tell you though, what, though, what's really going on. Right? <laughs> now, I, I got it. So... <laughs> that was hilarious. Well done. Okay, I got a couple of questions for you about this. Now we know that it's going to drag on a bit, you know, but it's a process, right? I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of things that I think I think he addressed very well in the decision. I think one is this whole nonsense of dangerous or unusual, which is not what the Supreme Court said. So it's a sort of a Boolean logic search. If you were to go into a computer and look for things that are dangerous and, both dangerous and unusual, you get an entirely different list than you would things that are dangerous or unusual. Then it's a lot longer it's list. Conjunctive and disjunctive. Yes. And what, what is it called? Conjunctive means both. Disjunctive means either. Yeah, and so there you have this. They want to, they want to make it either, but the problem with that is that every gun is dangerous. Right. Every arm of every kind is dangerous. Right. So, but that's a perfect example of how the state has twisted stuff, and some courts have bought into it by by saying, quoting the supreme, misquoting the Supreme Court, which said dangerous and unusual, and instead putting in the test is dangerous or unusual. And unless a judge gets deep enough into the weeds, reading Bruin, reading Heller, reading Staples, which is another big one, uh, and reading some and McDonald and Catano, unless they read those cases and really think about them, then that takes hours. You know, and some of these judges won't dedicate the time that ought to be dedicated to this. They pass it up. Uh, well, and to, that, and to that point, I would say we've been, I, I say we, because I've been doing it too, not just to every other gun owner I know. We've been complaining that Judge Benitez has been taken so long. I'm not complaining anymore because... No. I get it. I mean, he his decisions are so detailed and so well studied and so well thought out. And so, I mean, it takes hours and days to do. You know, every federal judge gets two law clerks and a couple of externs. OK, uh, I'm sure that his staff and he probably spent several hundred hours putting these decisions, these these rulings together and researching every single aspect of it. And making it bulletproof, trying to, when, so for when it goes up. But remember, again, the Ninth Circuit, 
sooner uh, one of these cases is going to go on bonk when it, when the ninth circuit rules on bonk by the way that becomes the rule for the circuit so if the ninth circuit on bonk says oh what the supreme court said was dangerous and unusual but we read that to re mean dangerous or unusual then that becomes the law of the circuit and that's the kind of thing that you have to get the supreme court to fix to because they twist the words and remember this is every town law this is Bloomberg's law firm, essentially, every town law that's running this show. The, these state attorneys, generals, deputy attorney generals, they're not writing this or, or, or most of this. They're not coming up with these theories. They're being spoon fed. And the states aren't coming up with these laws. Bloomberg's group is writing model laws and shipping it to people. And they're, they're involved in every step of the legislative process in trying to make these laws as harsh as they can make them. But unfortunately, the reality is that the gun owners, law-abiding, wouldn't hurt anybody unless that person was trying to hurt them or their family. Those are the ones who get ensnared in these complicated laws. The, the legacy of, of the California assault weapon law is accidental felons, accidental criminals. Overnight, your gun is sitting in a gun safe, so, stroke of some politician's pen, that gun becomes an assault weapon and you become a felon. That's who's paid the price for this. That and the victims who didn't have the tool that they needed to defend themselves, whether it's a handgun or a semi-automatic or, or whatever, or rifle or whatever, uh, they didn't have the tools to keep themselves from becoming victims. So in a very real sense, there's blood on the hands of the, of the politicians that passed this law because they've disarmed civilians who could have saved their own lives if they've, had the, if they've been able to access the right tool. Very interesting. So, it's a convoluted mess. You mentioned three cases, I think, that are already at the Ninth Circuit. Is there a benefit? I mean, you mentioned uh, Teeter or Tetter or whatever it is, which is the, the butterfly knife case, the Duncan, which is already there. It's the furthest one ahead. And now this one, which I think is Miller, isn't it? And then yeah. so you got those three there. Is there a benefit to having th having that volume of cases all being decided correctly under Bruin all at the Ninth Circuit at the same time? Does that well, does the fact that those are there inform the Ninth Circuit at all, or does that have any well, this is what happened, anything? This is what happened before Bruin. We had Rody, uh, Miller, uh, Rupp. Uh, trying to remember, there were several others, all of which were stayed behind Duncan, because Duncan was the one that was going to get an en banc ruling. So it's quite possible that some of these other cases will be frozen, stayed, while the Duncan on Bonk panel rules, uh, uh, rather than grant, uh, either they may grant on Bonk review and then stay the case, or they may just stay it until the on Bonk panel rules in Duncan. Uh, or in, uh, there may be some case that I'm not even aware of that's 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 uh, sitting on Bonk in the Ninth Circuit right now. Uh, point is, a lot of the, the, there's no advantage except that. The significance of the issue, and again, it's the underlying issue, the methodology, is made apparent to all the judges on the Ninth Circuit. And so they have to figure out, you know, which case will be the vehicle for settling this underlying issue. And in this case, Duncan's furthest along. So they may very well say, we're going to stay the, the Judge Benitez ruling in Miller, and then we're going to stay the whole case. And we're going to stay tether, and we're going to stay Wal Walford, which is the uh, sensitive places out of Hawaii. Uh, and they'll, they may freeze all those, like they did before, uh, before Bruin came down. They may freeze them all and say we're going to decide this issue in this main case. That's going to decide the issue in all these other cases, and then we'll come back and unfreeze them. How much of a contortionist legally is the Ninth Circuit going to have to twist itself into? to determine that these cases that Benitez has decided on and the decisions which are so detailed. I mean, he, w he went into dangerous and unusual. He settled the whole question of what use means, and he went through right. that whole process. Right. He went through the whole butter or the whole uh, uh, knife thing with the Bowie knife, the knife thing with he, the, he with the Swiss Farley knife. He, he covered militia. He talked about militia use. Yeah. AR-15s are appropriate for militia use. They're not exclusively military. He said that if, you, if, it's a, if a firearm, an arm is exclusively used for the military, then maybe it's 
uh, not entitled to the same degree of protection. But AR-15s, that's the whole point of the Bowie knife analogy and the Swiss Army knife analogy. It has multiple uses. If one of those is militia, it's still protected. Because it's useful for other stuff, right? Right. So, and so he went. He just. I mean, I read the decision and I thought, wow, this is a college. This is a, a you know a semester, at least a semester of a college course. This decision, maybe two, and and so, uh, as I read it, I look at it and go, I don't know. How does I uh, maybe I don't know. I was going to say, how does the Ninth Circuit actually? extricate themselves from that kind of a decision to decide differently and not look foolish, but I think they don't care about looking foolish. No, uh, some of them do. Some of them do. And that, so that's a really good question because it was easier to misinterpret Helen Heller once you got sort of a snowball rolling and some courts came up with this is how we'll interpret it, then others followed that even though it was being misinterpreted to begin with and it just built. Uh, there's no snowball in ruin right now. And there's going to be, and Bruin has made a lot of things clear that Heller didn't make as clear as I thought it did, but apparently the judges saw Heller differently based on what they were pitched by states. But but Bruin is not as easy because the Supreme Court, and this is what Judge Benitez did, he pulled the specific language out of the Supreme Court opinions and said, this is how it goes. It's going to be much harder for the Ninth Circuit to, to, to cheat, to, to, to bend over intellectually backwards and distort Bruin than it was for Heller to be distorted. And so I think uh, they're not, it's, they're not going to be able to just, you know, uh, steamroll over the Bruin opinion and, and, and distort it and get away with that. Uh, and some judges, even if they are liberal, uh, won't want to, to play that intellectual game. I hope. <laughs> you know, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping really, with you. So I, know, <laughs> I know some of these judges. I mean, I, I you know, they, they, they have a, they do take their, most of them take their oath seriously. And they recognize that they're an inferior court. And what the Supreme Court says goes, and they are bound by it, whether they like it or not. Some of them accept that. Can they sit on this thing and just let it sit there and gather dust for long periods? I I asked you that once before, but I I would love to. Miller, they can sit on Miller while Duncan plays out. Duncan is uh, on bonk, and there's an oral argument in March. So we have briefs already due. There'll there'll be an oral argument in March, and then they can sit on that after they have the if they take it under submission. After the oral argument is done, they then take the case under submission, and they have to issue a, an opinion. And I on, on previous times that we've talked, I pointed out how Maryland is still sitting on the Bianchi case from last December. That's the uh, uh, semi auto ban there. So they well, can. And, and, they can and this is one of the. Well, this is one of the frustrating parts I know for gun owners is these judges are appointed for life. So you, it, I mean, they're they're impossible to remove really for all practical purposes. I know it's possible to impeach them, but let's get real. They're not going anywhere unless they die or they quit or they retire. And so that being the case, there's really no. There's no uh, consequence if they cheat or fudge or play games. And so then that becomes the question, can we give them a, a, a case of, is there a, a point at which they played games and delayed to the point where we can give them a case of athlete scalp by tiptoeing well, over a, their head to the Supreme Court? Yes. there's a, And also there's also a mechanism for complaining, uh, filing a complaint about a judge. But be careful about what you wish for here. Uh, elected judges, I think, are worse. Because if they do anything that, even if it's the right thing to do, but they do it and it and it gets in the news as you know they let this guy go, and uh, they don't get reelected, so they're always thinking about their next election, just like a politician, the state court judges, as opposed to the federal court judges with lifetime appointment. It's supposed to, the theory is that if you're appointed for life, you're not subject to the political influences, but the reality is you're still subject to your own political influences, even if it's not uh, fear of being uh, not being reelected. All right. Well, is, our, is there anything else we should talk about with it, or did we cover well, it? Just, just, you know, CRPA is still on the Duncan case. CRPA and Second Amendment Foundation will be doing 
uh, amicus briefs in the Ninth Circuit on the Miller case and every other case that's up there. So uh, between uh, all these different cases and between the CRPA, the the uh, Second Amendment Law Center, Second Amendment Foundation, uh, you know, these are groups that probably deserve some support. If you got a few shekels laying, or, laying around uh, that you can help and just stay involved and comment and watch CRPA TV for the latest. You know, you, you, you brought up something, I think, um, because earlier you were talking about the fact that judges only have so many, they have, their staff is limited. Their time is limited. They got a caseload like that. So a lot of times they don't spend time doing a lot of the research that obviously Judge Benitez did. Is that where the amicus briefs come in? Is that the point behind them to educate well, the judges? Y yes, because the, the, this is all what I call deep think. Okay. <laughs> this is what Let's I see. tell my now, lawyers. I got to think more. How many cups of coffee have I had today? <laughs> I don't know if I can deep think. It's very difficult these days with multitasking and all the distractions in our lives to, to focus. To focus. You know, this is what I enjoyed the most when I was a young lawyer was actually sitting down and reading the cases carefully and, and digging down into the details and understanding the differences between the different areas of law. A lot of times... Lawyers don't have time to dig that deep. Uh, you know, I, I tell my lawyers, get rid of the distractions. You have to get rid of the distractions and focus to do a good job, to understand the issues at the level they need of depth and detail that they need to be understood. And so some judges don't take that time. Judge Benitez took that time and, and, and a lot more uh, to put his decision together properly. Don't lose hope. We, 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 are, we are making more progress than we've made in the last two decades. Let's put it that way. It was hopeless for a while there. Right. The, 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 in California in particular. Yeah. Uh, and now it is not. Look at Newsom's press release. Look at him screaming about how Bruin is devastating. Uh, you know, uh, he's crying. There, there are changes taking place. There, there is a new... Uh, dynamic going on and and it will keep going in other fields some autos magazines prohibited people, people prohibited places the barriers are being broken down slowly painfully i know <laughs> but they are and I, you know what I, I appreciate you a lot chuck i appreciate you coming on let me put you on the hot seat a little bit <laughs> oh. he'll never speak to me again now oh, that's it <laughs> i speak to groups of people uh, you know, as CRPA president, I'm out there all the time. All the time, right. Just at Route 66 all, all a couple, time. two weeks ago. Uh, yeah. And, you know, everybody has the same concern, and I totally understand it. I yeah. totally understand it. Uh, uh, all I can tell you is I got my teeth in their ankle, and I ain't letting go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm grateful. <laughs> you need to get a couple of bulldogs in there to help you, I think. You probably have a few on your staff. Chuck, thank you very much, man. Have a wonderful week and a great oh, weekend. You, and I appreciate you coming on hey, the show. Brother. Have me back anytime. You betcha. Thank you very much for watching the entire video. I hope it helped. Um, you know, Chuck and I talk about some tough stuff on this show, and I ask him tough questions. Thank God he's willing to just sit there and sit in the hot seat once in a while, so that helps a ton. If you have questions you'd like Chuck to answer, and I can possibly help you do that, you can throw them into the comments if you want, and I will try to look for the look at the comments over the next few days. If I see any, I'll ask him to respond to those, and he's pretty good about doing that, so you can do that. Uh, on any of the platforms, if it's, I, I can't look at all of them. So if you're on some weird platform I don't even know about, I'm not going to see them. But if you put it on YouTube, Twitter, Rumble, I'll check those. And I will try to get a response from him on those for you. And then as soon as anything changes with regard to any new decisions from Judge Benitez, or if there's any major changes with these court cases or anything else for that matter, I'll be producing another interview for you with the key person here on Gun Guy TV, so stick around. If you'd like to support what I do, I would really appreciate it because I pay for it out of my pocket, believe it or not. You can do that by going to gunguytvcrew.com, and you can join Gun Guy TV Crew on either Patreon or Locals. Hopefully one day on Twitter. i got to wait for them to approve it, but if they do, we'll do it on Twitter as well. It's very inexpensive, and it gives you access to some exclusive content you can't get anywhere else, and it also helps me produce this show. So please join. Have a great week. Thank you very much for everything you do. Wherever you go, whatever you do, stay safe.